Um, thank you for joining us today for our final conversation in a series of talks and panel discussions coinciding with Gaja Gallery's ongoing show, Igusti Ayu Kadek Murmiasi, Shards of My Dreams That Remain in My Consciousness. So my name is Nicole of Gaja Gallery, and today we will be talking to Edmondo Zanolini and Niwayan Suarniti, two people who are very close to the artist Murni. In this talk, they'll share their personal memories of the artist, offering rare insights into her process, personality, and the ways in which her art and life connected. So I'd just like to remind everyone that at the end of this conversation, we will be answering some questions from the audience. So feel free to type in your questions at the Q&A box here at the bottom of your screen, and you'll respond to them later. Um, I'd just like everyone to know as well that we're recording this, so just so everyone is everyone knows <laughs> that this, this is being recorded, this meeting. Um, and before we begin the conversation, I just want to give a brief background of the gallery for those joining us today. So since 1996, Gaja Gallery has been a pioneering body in the Southeast Asian art scene, representing a portfolio of the, the region's leading artists, as well as engaging some of its brightest emerging talents. In 2012, we opened the Jogja Art Lab in Jogjakarta, Indonesia, as an experimental platform for artists to come together and produce works across various mediums. Yao has been working with artists like Ashley Bickerton, Unizar, and Suzanne Victor. Like I mentioned earlier, currently on view at our Singapore space is the solo show of the late Balinese artist Igusti Ayu Katek Murniasi, Shards of My Dreams That Remain in My Consciousness. So the show brings together a diverse collection of paintings and sculptures that span the artist's prolific decade-long career from the mid-1990s to 2006. So this is actually our last weekend of the show. So for those who are based in Singapore, please visit the gallery if you haven't yet so you can check it out. Um, now I'm so, so honored to introduce our speakers for today. So first we have Edmondo Zanellini here behind his stuffed toy <laughs> that was by Murni, <laughs> and he'll talk more about that later. So he is a nomadic multimedia artist working in performance, video, installation, and painting. In his recent works, he tries to exercise the disintegration of memory by reproducing new situations in which the photograph subjects are cut, reassembled, curled, modified, and staged in paintings. So it's also important to note that he was Murni's partner for over a decade, having been with her since the early 1990s until her death in 2006. Niwayan Suarniti here, joining us from Arizona, was the former general manager of the Seniwati Gallery of Art by Women in Ubud, Bali. So this was the gallery, um, this was the gallery where Murni had her first solo exhibition and which continued to support her throughout her career. Its founder, Mary Northmore, is also joining us today, if I'm not mistaken. I think I saw her name earlier, so that's great. Um, during that time, Moyan became close friends with Murni, and like Mondo, continued to stay with her until her late years in the mid-2000s. Today, Moyan and her husband run a bed and breakfast in Tucson, Arizona, called Crickhead in Bed. She also continues to showcase Indonesian art, I think in that space, every year. So... Wayan and Mondo, I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you so much. It's been so great to have like been talking to you since the beginning of this year. You've both been so supportive with the show and so generous with your stories when I would interview you personally. So I'm glad you get to share now with more people all your wonderful memories. I just want to add that we also have um, our director, Jasteep Sandhu, joining us in the meeting today who actually met Murni once. So he may chime in in the conversation later on to share his thoughts too. So we can just go right into the conversation because I'm sure there's a lot you both would love to remember and talk about. So let's start from, I guess, the beginning. Um, you know, when you first met Murni, I always ask this to people who knew her or had met her. What was her personality like? I know she was a very sociable, friendly person, but you know, as you both got closer to her and got more intimate with her, did she ever you know, reveal other sides to you as well? What do you remember about 
I guess the complexity of, of that, of her personality. Anyone can start if maybe Wayan, would you like to? Um, Armando? Yeah. You want to start, Armando? <laughs> would you like? Um, let's take it chronologically. Like uh, who met Murni first? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. who, wa who was it? You. <laughs> oh. You, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, it's about the, the loving question uh, who transued uh, from her. her <clears throat> Even nowadays, I always face the same questions about the others. How is with love and hate? And uh, really most 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 of the people here around <laughs> they generally speaking hate they hate who they don't know right um lu uh, murni was loving who she didn't know even you know that's the the input uh, there is a, is, is a totality of uh, attitude in life. So there is no other uh, uh, questions about, for me, about her, uh, in, you know, who she really was, is what appeared from the first instant so from the first instant, I was magnetized in love with her. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wayan, you were the second one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, when I met her in the gallery as uh, um, the first time, because she she's just so lively and different than um almost everybody in all the artists they have their own uh, character and own um personality but gusti murni is just um so lively and, and uh, so generous and uh, care to everybody and really want to work so hard and helping each other Thank you for that. It's so nice to get a feel of, yeah, like her spirit as well. And remember her. And um, let's start also, like, we also want to go chronologically with her, her own life. And um, would you remember anything that she shared about her early life? Perhaps for those who didn't know much, who don't know much about her background growing up. In Bali, then South Sulawesi, then eventually your time in Ujung Pandang and Jakarta. There was so much movement and also a struggle during those years. She didn't just work as a domestic worker, but she eventually became a seamstress and briefly went to school. Did she ever share with you guys um, how she felt about all of this, how she overcame, or maybe how these experiences shaped her throughout? Her, even her later years, by the time you met her. Who, who is there? Who, who is there? Wayan, me. Yeah, anyway, well, you know, uh, she was so, so busy for, in, in my sight, uh, with the present, uh, that everything who come from the past, what she knew to do, for instance, would be uh, constantly there and the need uh, uh, from her side always more passion and more getting in and better making, you know, this kind. Of. So it was not like a time for the confidence of the past, not, not, not in, at all in the first years, you know, um, it was so oriented everything on what is happening and make it as uh, very much and also 
Um, the, the moment of just relax and joy. Uh, we, we discovered East Bali became our preferred place to where just uh, uh, get out uh, of everything and enjoy the sea and the shells. And she mm -hmm. and me would collect a ton of little shells there uh, to bring it back to our place to <laughs> put on the floor somewhere or, you know, whatever. But it was a constant attention on forms because a, a little shell, awesome. if you look, if you look from close, uh, well, uh, is mind blowing for forms, for power of uh, uh, putting together colors and things, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so it, it's a very, very interesting discovering to be at the seaside uh, for Murni. Uh, so pure forms, yeah. That that, that that's it. Uh, and uh, Wayan, uh, <laughs> please, what do you yes. remember? Yeah, I I remember. She told me the story that when she was in Sulawesi, she and then she worked for uh, somebody when she was still like a, a, a primary school. And then she, uh, she told me when she was in Jakarta, also she worked for somebody and she get the money to pay for her school, uh, continue her school at secondary school. Mm -hmm. So she, um, but she, she told me her boss is so nice and so mm -hmm. kind to her. And so she, she, she share her feelings, she working hard since she was a child, so. And um, I think she told us that story because when I helping her um, to organize the painting with my niece, and so my niece, she tried to um, explain and express her feeling when she was a child, she working hard. And so she want to share it with my niece. So my niece, um, because my niece is, by herself, so she doesn't feel like she she's so spoiled and thing like that. So uh, Gusti Murni want to become like a, a, what you call it the the uh, model of um, the the little girl because my niece on that time was like a secondary school, so mm -hmm. she's still so young and but my niece is come with me to helping. Gusti Murni, we stay there all day. Sometimes we stay overnight. So um, that the reason she told us the story about her uh, past when she was in Sulawesi and then in Jakarta. She, she never give up. Uh, even though she's still a child, she has to work, um, but she just do it um, whatever she can do. And she enjoyed, I think she, she never complained like that. She never feeling that she has to do it, but she, even though she has to do it, but she doesn't feel that she under pressure. And then wow. she will be, yeah. She learned mm -hmm. how to work at a very young age. What, Wayan? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wayan, but what, what I remember is that Murni actually only had three elementary class. When she followed the family, the Chinese family to Jakarta, who was the same family mm -hmm. who was in uh, uh, Sulawesi where she was working. Mm -hmm. There, she had intense program of work, also taking care of the little daughter of, of this family, uh, meaning uh, from very early morning to get ready to get to school and all that. And, but mm -hmm. she didn't go to school to secondary and so on for 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 what i know mm -hmm. huh? yeah what or do maybe you... that was when when my niece was uh um there she she said like that so i thought she just starting uh -huh. a secondary school or something like that mm -hmm. she never finished yeah uh, because or maybe she was just saying she doesn't be able to go to secondary school or something like that. But she was mentioned it with my yeah. niece when my niece was secondary school uh, when I 
uh, when we helping her to uh, organize the painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah she told me that the story that she worked um, since your child. Yeah, she's always yeah. been working. And it's, ama it's amazing that, that she became also like such an amazing artist without also background in art training, like a formal art education training. She didn't go necessarily to an art school. Um, and I know that Mondo, you were there when she, you know, decided to pick up that brush and paint with you and, and the other Balinese artist, Moko. Yeah. Um, can you share with us a bit more about that memory of when Marini decided to become an artist? Yeah, yeah, with, yeah. Without that background and <clears throat> um so she asked for it and that's the 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 point mm -hmm. uh then uh, the studium uh, is uh, coming <clears throat> uh you know she want immediately to do a woman and a snake and uh, um well and then she see that uh, as uh, using uh, with Mokko the um, Pongo second style uh, let's call it you start uh, drawing whatever with the with the pencil mm -hmm. then with the pencil is easy to remodify till you want you really know what you want. You are looking for it uh, with a pencil, like uh, if you are sculpting, let's say. And then when you get it, usually with a pen, you do the, the drawing exactly where you want uh, the pencil show you and so on and so on. Now, for her to arrive to make a hand, <gasps> problem. I can never make a hand, but you you know at the end she succeeded. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and that's it because it's beyond what naturalism can give us as experience of drawing a hand. Mm -hmm. uh, mind has wider limits, so. Thank you, mind, which is the real school all the time. But the rest, as absorbing, can be somebody who loves and love and love. Uh, she could play with anything. Mm -hmm. Then she can find as a stimulation to produce her reaction which is always on the mirror of expressing herself yeah uh, so it can be even uh, you are sitting in an airplane and there is the pamphlet there of the perfumes mm -hmm. yeah and you look the perfume thing and you find one thing there then you want to make your own and you recuperate that and you go on with so can take from anything mm -hmm. yeah printed or in the wind she got inspiration yeah. everywhere basically but yes yeah. so so we are all if we are that kind of mental state of children for instance mm -hmm. children okay uh, if we can still be children, well, uh, to 96, like my father. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I remember, Mondo, you telling me before that when she was starting out, she kind of had some apprehensions. Sometimes she'd, she'd be like, oh, no, I can't, I can't draw. And... Yeah. But you were encouraging her, right? What was that? What did you say to push her? Or, I guess. Yes. Okay, let's go back to the to the hand, and then uh, okay. If uh, you start to making, then anyway, there are five fingers. Let's keep it like this. Oh, look! I make two pointy. Just mm. make it very pointy. You oh, know, yeah. it's the point to discover where you are. Uh, drove to go 
because uh, even if uh, look mm, you and me we draw one square okay and i draw one square and you draw one square there will be two different 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 squares mm -hmm. yeah yeah. So ride on your difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's good advice. <laughs> uh -huh. And you were both actually you both actually watched her her unique process. I remember you both were both of you told me that you know she liked particularly working at night. She had this habit of waking up from her sleep and then drawing or painting immediately after. Could any of you share about more about these, these quirks and habits she had in her artistic process? Why was she so creative at night? And no, look, uh, see, uh, when, when uh, that was not at the beginning, that was a bit later, mm. right? I mean, and, mm -hmm. and uh, for sure, uh, doing the hours of the day, I, I was uh, doing my things in okay. my places and she was doing her things okay. in her places we would meet and that, that would be excellent occasion for something sometime but uh, uh, you know by by then she was flying on her own and i i was uh, still flying on my own uh yeah um then, then uh, you know, her obsession became progressive, uh, and then, and then it's pure uh, thing coming out. But uh, yeah, arriving to uh, to nights to uh, get asleep uh, with the brush in the hand <laughs> like the gun, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, like yes, a fake crime scene. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I, I actually would would uh, take her to bed. Yes. When she was, how about you, Wyan? What do you remember when you would witness her? Maybe during the day, would you remember how she was? No, like? I, I was. No, we was there, me and my niece, uh, we was working until late uh, at night and she said, decided to just stay with me here. So we sleep overnight over there. And then suddenly when I went to the um, bathroom and I saw her painting in the middle of the night at 12 o'clock at night. So I asked her, um, good morning. Why are you um, still uh, awake? And she said, I, I already, because at 10 o'clock, we already sleep, all of us. And then mm -hmm. suddenly, when I go to the bathroom, she already painting. And she said she um, was dreaming about something. And then immediately she um, get up and get the canvas and uh, painting. So she told me that so often she did it like that when she, um, at night, if she dream about something and then she uh, paint it. And I think I also heard somebody, um, I think from Batuan, um, also like that. So one of the artists, mm -hmm. they said they have a power, uh, like energy in the middle of the night. And then that, that energy make the paintings is feel, have an energy. I can, I can feel it and I can tell that like, uh, don't know, because for us in Balinese, we, their spirit in the middle of the night um, is different than spirit daytime that I will believe as a Balinese. Right. So it could be that the one also helping uh, in her paintings to have a spirit like that. So interesting. Um, yeah, thank yes. you. Is a, is a, the unconscious level which is free to come out with all the energy and the power of it and uh, you fish on it and you go more deep in your own uh, yeah. representation uh, form and substance are one thing so the meaning come across right away of what you do because it's essential and yes. 
the, the, this factor of essentiality is really a key to go through the understanding of Murni work is the power of essential, of making not simple just, but true something. True. Yes. Even beyond what we can see, because uh, what mm -hmm. we can see is maybe just to tell, oh, there are two leaves in one glass. Mm. But, <laughs> but those two leaves in that glass has a resonance then take you somewhere else it, with a code that is very personal, but in the same way is universal. Mm. That's the essence of what uh, Murni does. <laughs> yeah, actually, Astri, Astri Wright, who's also joining us today, does speak really well about this in her talk with us and in her essay as well about, you know, the spiritual dimensions in her work and seeing beyond what the eye can see as well. And it's yes. so interesting to go deep into that. Like what were some of, you talk about also like the subconscious that she was, that was very active in, in her process and in her art. And would you remember being very close to her? Was there, were there particular themes that were, particularly close to her or it seems that you, you felt she had this strong urge to bring out in her work that were always recurring or something that's always you know keeping her up at night or and things like or yeah she always wanted to let out um was this specifically uh, towards me uh, this question or also Ayan? both of you whatever you both remember oh please Please, Wayan, you start. <laughs> I only have that one uh, experience, so I think Mundu have more experience. <laughs> because, because, uh, yeah, I only have those one night. Um, I've been with her several times, um, but only one on that one night, I was shocking to see her uh, 12 o'clock at night and just starting to pain. And so the only time I asked her, why do you paint at night? And so she told me that um, she just want to paint and she has more energy. And then so then I realized um, because other artists did it also, um, maybe because of that, uh, some energy at night, like Mondo was mentioned. But Mondo have more experience because <laughs> <laughs> he lives to Murni. Yeah. Um, well, <coughs> oh, um, she was also talking while dreaming. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, she was also interactive in the talking. So <coughs> going on. You could talk to her, and if I didn't understand something, I would ask more <coughs> about in order to understand what she meant, which function. Uh, uh, yes, this uh, gave me some inlays in things that were uh, at the unconscious level of her. Um, but uh, um, uh, maybe I'm out lounge meeting relaunch oh sorry I think someone it's okay Mondo you can keep talking oh yeah, yeah. was I talking Um, um, uh, I may, uh, you know, 
about my, what was my mind my mind uh, goes back to the drama stories because her her dreams were also dramatic at uh, the ta at times yes um but the the question of uh, uh, of the father abuse that that came uh, consciously murni wanting to tell me that it was not uh, uh, doing our uh, conversation uh, across the river, yeah. yeah. And um, I have this one question, particularly for Wyan, when she did, you know, because you met her when she was at Saniwati, if I'm not mistaken, and you saw her works there. What was it like when you saw it for the first time? And what was, I guess, your reaction? What struck you about them then? And how are they different from what you were typically seeing in Bali, by other Balinese artists? Yeah, it's a big difference. That's why I still remember when we had her show, the first solo show um, at the um, our Suniwati show space. And most of the local people um, was feeling like uh, this surprise. And um, mm -hmm. because we never see any kind of paintings like that, especially by Balinese. And usually for us in the gallery, I saw the like uh, dancing or woman, uh, uh, about the woman, about the um, uh, landscape or ceremony, thing like that. But it's, it was so different. So I start to learn uh, to enjoy in, um, another kind of uh, artwork. Yeah, do you remember what what the reaction was to her works then when she first started exhibiting in Bali? Yeah, for for us, or like I said, uh, all of us. I think also some of the um, visitor, especially local visitor, when we opening. Um, it's never see that kind of paintings. And so they was um, feeling like, oh, wow, the first time they was thought like a porno, um, pornography, but mm -hmm. like Dr. Astri said that uh, it's not a pornography and it's uh, like a fun, it's like an art uh, like that. And so the same as the one when, when I, I found the sponsor for her to do the show in Melbourne, also people in Melbourne like that. And so they, they was, uh, it's unusual. So they have a, a, a different impression, but after a while they understand and they, they accepted it. That's interesting. So even in different places, both in, in Bali and abroad, there was that, that shocked reaction to her works. Yes, uh, from the beginning, eh, for the beginning, just for a while, and then after they know the artist story mm. and the background, and then people start to understand and they accepted it. And it continued to evolve. Continue, yeah. And after the first show, I think Mary also um, remember it, and, uh, and people start to accept it and enjoying her artwork. Mondo, do you remember if any, did she ever share with you how she felt about these reactions to her works? Uh, she felt excellent. Oh, really? She, yeah. Yes, of course. Um, uh, greater and greater she felt because there was greater and greater appreciation. Uh, we, we, we are not at the numbers of the rock star, uh, but anyway, you know, uh, uh, she was really excited by uh, the interest of people and reward. So even with the shock at the beginning of her career, she was still very happy about the reaction. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. She had a very good spirit <laughs> yeah, yeah because yeah. she she just want to ex 
express her uh, feeling through the artwork. And so she, she doesn't mind what people think about her work yeah. because she just want to, this is me. Um, this is my uh, artwork. And so um, she just keep doing it and she making painting anytime she feel like it and she just worked so hard. Yeah, she worked. And she made a lot of works. I remember, Wayan, you were telling, telling me about when you had to catalog all of her works, hundreds of them. Do you remember? Uh, yeah, um, uh, but Mondo continuing after that because I was so busy with other things. And um, the reason I um, helping her to organize because one day she we send uh, from the gallery, we send uh, a guest to to her place, and then then she called me and uh, she always called me Sayangku like that, like uh, my dear, my darling thing like that. And she called me uh, the man who came here and asked me to open four hundred paintings, but <laughs> I couldn't find the painting, and I was shocking. Four hundred painting, you have to open it and. And I said, uh, why, why do you have this and that? And so, because I feel so bad and in in one, maybe in half and I or whatever, how many hours they was there and opening all of those things, it just it feels so crazy. And so I said to her, okay, um, when I uh, have time, my day off, I will uh, help you to do organized and like that. So I, I I asked my niece to take me there with the motorbike. And so I was teaching her niece, Gusti Murni niece, to helping me to organize. So I asked her if you have pending uh, photos. And so I saying like this, like this. And so next time when somebody come, want to see your art, artwork, just open this book, give this album. And so let have information and then have a, we make the code. And then because her painting on that time is stored in many different places and some of them get um, leaking from the roof. And so I feel so bad. And um, so I try to help her. So she, yeah, she has so many paintings like uh, on that time was hundred, but, and then when Mondo continued like a thousand, become a thousand of her artwork, so. Yeah, yeah. In in fact, you you started with Murni to make uh, the cataloging. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 what I continued uh, after her uh, pass away, it was just continuing and uh, you know on the base of already the numbers of code that you gave. Yeah. So I just continue yeah. that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, I saw you took some of the uh, taking photograph also because some of her artwork didn't have a photograph, yeah. and it was rolling, rolling like that, and she just suppling up in her uh, yeah, like uh, a story. Yeah, it's not yeah, story. Yeah. It's just like a what do you call it that mondo, just like a a, a building, like a, yeah. it's yeah. a building yeah. with the uh, with the cell. Uh, up there is so no protection uh, well in many different places uh, on that time yeah. so yeah. and then I, I i i teaching the her niece and then my niece helping and uh, we doing the photos and organize it so every um wednesday on that time i die off i i spend all day in there for several yeah. months i think. i i still have the catalogs that you made, the original, uh -huh. yeah, I still have. Uh, it was a pre-digital world, so there yeah. was a photo cut, uh, a photo print, you know, uh, yeah. and, and glue in the catalog yeah. Uh, yeah. next yeah. to all the data information, right? Uh -huh. yeah. And we have to, uh, ha like a handwriting and thing like yeah. that, and yeah. so it's yeah. just like a uh, it's not like now, it's everything electronic. So on that yeah, time, sure. it's just manual. Sure. 
Uh, but I, one I, I, one. I still have them, yeah, it's important to have uh, that was the first uh, cat catalogation and uh, yeah. good already to be the same continuing uh, mm, for what yeah. it was. <laughs> Thank you for, for doing the hard work of doing that, both of you. Um, uh, we're, we're nearing the last 15 minutes, but I have just one more question for you from myself. Um, since both of you were very close to her during her later years, um, especially when she fell ill, uh, Wayan, I know you accompanied her to the healer in the temple when she found out. And Mondo, you took her to Bangkok um, for treatment and stayed with her there. What was she like during those later years? And she, know, she continued creating works until the end, right? So I guess, what was she like and how did those works change during that time? Maybe Mon uh Wayan, you can go first since I remember you accompanied her to the doctor. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, uh, one day that she called me um, to the gallery, um, my darling, uh, I have this happening uh, to myself. And then I was talking and I said, um, Gusti Muni, we have to go to the doctor, checking with my doctor. And she said, no, I don't want to go to the doctor. And then I said, you have to, my doctor is like my mom, she's so sweet. She, so I organized it, she, she doesn't want to go to the doctor. So I keep talking to her. And so one day finally she agreed. So I uh, took, took her to my doctor in Denpasar. And then so my doctor, as soon as she checked it and she just shaking her head. And my doctor um, said, uh, Dr. Ino Susanti, she just passed away. Um, she said to me, why don't you take her to uh, Sangla Hospital tomorrow? You have to like that. And so uh, uh, I, on that time, I, I asked Ibu Mary if I can have my day off to accompany her to Sangla because she she so trauma with the doctor and she even asked my doctor, uh, but doctor, can you go to Sangla with me? And the doctor said, no, um, it will be a doctor in the, in the hospital. So I, I accompany her and then Mary was uh, so sweet and she said, okay, you do it. And so, um, and then she, they get checked her and uh, she was screaming and I, I talked to the doctor and, and then when, when we, uh, we have to get the resort the next, the following weeks. And so the company again to get the resort and then on the way home, we eat um, in Mamal. Uh, and she, usually we share things. On that time, she said to me, uh, darling, don't touch my food because, because she know already positive. Uh, she already get cancer, sodium four um, and then she thought the, the, the cancer is like, uh, um, what do you call it? Like the uh, contagious. Contagious. Yeah, but I know cancer is, uh, ovary cancer is not contagious. And so she, usually we sell drink, we sell food and uh, as, as, as always we sell everything. But on that time, she doesn't want me to touch her food and she doesn't touch my food because she concerned about me. And I said, no. Is not worried, but she still she doesn't want. So on that on that night, um, I I sleep at her uh, place, and she asked me, okay, send email to Mondo, and so I type an email because she um, she feeling maybe not uh, so well. I don't know, but she she doesn't shock or she doesn't cry or anything like that. She just she's still so strong and thing like that, and. Um, I sent a mail to Mondo, and then the next day I took her to uh, the Hilo just to leave her up, and and then at the Hilo place, and so the Hilo we was praying as a normal as Balinese, and um, she just flipped herself uh, on the floor, and she just crying and crying and crying and crying, and so we. Me and my friend um, was uh, try to accompany her and, and the, also the Hilo um, try to lift her up, but she just she just uh, apologized to God and and asked for the forgiveness and all this thing. And so 
the Shilo asked her to, okay, drink this and that and can I get them? Um, and then uh, when she back to, when Mondo took her to Bangkok and she was uh, get the trapeze of chemo and then she, after one and a half years, Mondo, or one, one year, and then she come home for uh, a few weeks or one month, something like that. And so in, instantly she came to the gallery and she doesn't have, she has a short hair. And so this was the one she gave it to me as a present from uh, when she um, back from Bangkok. And then I took her back to the Hilo just to have her uh, energy. So, and, uh, um, and then when, when she back the last time, um, I arranged the transportation and everything. And then I visit her before I come to here to America. And she was feeling, she was already very, very weak. And um, she said to me, she hold my hand. Don't leave sister, don't leave. And don't go, don't go like that. But I have to go. So it's one week before my trip to here to do the show. And that the last time I see her, she was doing the treatment on the, on the band. And so then I... Thank you, Waya. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that. But I don't know we we'll have more time with her. Yes, we'd love uh, to. Oh, yeah. Fortunately, the issues that uh, Modni faced are two very, I would say, prevalent is issues of women, uh, sexual abuse and an ovarian cancer, you know, both somehow. Um, so I wanted to, to sort of understand her journey or her shift uh, or focus from in her art, in the work that she did from, you know, uh, bringing to light the plight that she had gone through, which, uh, which is sexual uh, uh, assault and, and, and uh, sexual uh, abuse issues towards childbearing, which is also a woman's problem. And the fact that, you know, ovarian cancer mm -hmm. sort of affect in a way um, the other aspect of uh, women's uh, livelihood. Was there a shift in her work? Do you see a notable kind of, one is expressing her anguish and, you know, and bringing to light this, um, the trauma that she went through, shifting it towards, again, another trauma of, of you know, cancer, yes, but specifically ovarian cancer, which is only a woman could, could experience it, you know, and, and in not being able to, of course, um, family, children, and all that. Do you see a shift of, of her, her, her expression in her work uh, to light? Because I was, I saw some of the work at, at Gaja the other time, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and yes, I see the sexual and you know, what she wants to bring to light. Uh, and, but towards the end of her, her, her life, which was the part of cancer, a couple of installation work, you know, being caged, uh, you know, sort of tell me this, the story. But I wanted to ask, was uh, to, to both of you who are very close to her, was there a shift you, you notice in her work from one aspect to another? That's a great question. I think Mondo will have that answer because uh, after the cancer, she is in Bangkok with Mondo most of the time. So I only saw her several times after she back from, uh, when she just take a break from uh, the treatment. And then I didn't see her artwork because I taking her to the uh, healer and we doing fun thing, so we don't really um, doing the art. So because she doing all of her art in Bangkok during that time, so Mono will give that uh, information. 
Yeah, um, the the sculptures anyway were were the expression of what she wanted to make at the time. It was when after six months of Bangkok, she came for a month or so, yes, uh, to Bang uh, to to Bali, and then before getting back there for another six months, and and then she had the first the operation. And then again, chemo and radio uh, stuff. In fact, uh, not wanting to spend too much time on the doctor scene, uh, I would say that she is really got uh, in that year of facing death, she got a master of life for me is is an uh, outstanding example of how you can die she in one year she did not cry one time in one year she did not uh, complain one time of her fate and her physical uh, horrors yeah so uh, really, I mean, uh, a master of uh, art, yes, but she was in front of my eyes a master when she faced death. And uh, it is not correct for me to ask what, uh, what became her art uh, in consequence of this uh, difference uh, state, because uh, she was conscious of the possibility for her to die soon from the start. There were um, signs of this consciousness in her, in her pics in art. She, the watch, the watch then was often around arms, around foot, around nyo -nyo, around everything, mm -hmm. and pressing a bit the meat to remember the time, the time this uh, question then death would come soon. Anyway, that was much before knowing she had a cancer of that kind. Also, in 97, 98, she was already operated for something like that, uh, ovarian level, um, in, in Bali, in, uh, in the hospital of the militaries. You remember, Wayan? Yeah, I, I, I remember that one, but I don't, I'm not really involved, but we know that she was positive when doing the pap smear and in the gallery that Ibu Mary was organized that all the artists, uh, we invite Dr. Ino to, Dr. Ino Susanti that my doctor, that the one uh, helping her, is already yeah. told her that she positive and then, but she, um, she said she doesn't follow up, so uh, maybe that the one follow up when uh, when with you um, when she was uh, getting the surgery. But on yeah. that time, I'm I'm not involved in that uh, when she get uh, have a surgery in that year. Yeah. But the test was like I think 1996 that the one we doing the. Ibu Mary organized a special for all of our artists to do the free pap smear that Dr. Yeah. Ino Susanti, her foundation uh, did it and she was positive on that time. Oh, not positive, what do you call it? Like uh, uh, abnormal or whatever, but I think she doesn't follow yeah, up, uh, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, th that, that consciousness in her painting, in her work, uh, went on, you know, so I see it not only because in the last year, yes, she painted some things, uh, very, very few because uh, 
she not have the force and anyway she painted staying in bed mm. uh, uh, like uh, and she gave away uh, everything almost you know because it was uh, uh, somebody come to see her or so she would give the, the painting and she would give the painting you understand so what she did there she gave away to visitors mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We'd love to get more questions from the audience. If you guys have questions, feel free to just speak in, like, or you can type it on the chat box here as well. One more question. <laughs> yeah, please, please go. Uh, you were mentioning that uh, she has a lot of work being done. How? How? How much of her work has been exhibited or been shown? I mean, from what I gather, what I know of Murni, um, the, the, the work that I, the, the, the body of work that I've seen are, are still quite small. I mean, obviously during her short life, but um, so I'm just curious how, how much of her work uh, have been shown and how much more could we expect to see coming up? Mondo, would you? Um, <laughs> well, you know, she actually, um, during her life, she showed um, in Jakarta mainly uh, with the uh, Nadi Gallery. Uh, a couple of hundred paintings at the time were exhibited. Um, and then... Uh, mm, she had uh, shows in Italy, in Hong Kong, in Spain, uh, and so on, where, uh, anyway, it's not the quantity uh, that is important of her paintings, but because you see, for instance, uh, uh, the numbers uh, uh, than, than we were uh, talking about, the most most painting are very very small um 20 by 25 uh, 15 by 20 you know and so on uh those are hundreds and uh, uh, they were not uh, really shown because uh, uh also the the question of uh, you know how galleries are thinking about market if you put on uh, something very small that cost very little doesn't show good they think uh, it, it would be a point to make an exhibition only of the small but also it would be i guess a point uh, to make an exhibition only for children of murni because uh, uh, to know her <laughs> um, is important to, to, to evaluate uh, part of her world that up to now, you know, were not really put uh, much in, in focus. I am sure that there are uh, uh, hundreds of paintings that would be lovely for children to look. And uh, I seen with my daughter, uh, already when she was four years old, she would see on, uh, on, uh, on the computer screen, different kind of artist painting. And at the time then there was one Murni, she said Murni. She recognized at four years old when there was a picture of a painting of Murni. Uh, you understand, she wouldn't say Murni to a Picasso, but she would say Murni when there was Murni shown. So is it even recognizable for children? And uh, there are uh, <coughs> hundreds of images uh, which does not show any sexual organs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, no problem. And children would get the point not the studium, is she or not a feminist? <laughs> a studium, an inquire to make and, 
kilometers of uh, analysis. Uh, the humor, the children, they get as a prevalent factor and they have a key there. Of course, a person then, then does not have any sense of humor uh, would not uh, take that highway to get to the Murni factor. But other ways, and children has this uh, sensibility for humor, then uh, often is castrated lately from the adults, but they all have. They laugh when they are babies, you see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, Jazz Deep, who's joining us as well today, as I mentioned earlier. Um, would you like to add anything, Jazz Deep? Uh, Justin, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. We just yeah. can't see you. Uh, just, just, just an observation that, you know, uh, there's so much uh, n um, knowledge and, inf and information which is still very much missing. I think we know much less uh, about Murni and her life, especially her early life, um, than we actually do know of her. And um, this information that um, Ibu Wayan and uh, Mondo is giving us is actually vital, but there are other people as well. Uh, Ibu Mary Northmore, etc. I think um, from the gallery's point of view, we've just started our, our venture into trying to get to know more of her. For example, the first the first show that she did at um, Saniwati Gallery. I, um, what was the whole setup? What was the lighting? What was the curation? The titling? Uh, was she involved in the placement? Ibu Wayan, you know, one day we need to sit down and get this um, com uh, this whole event completely, uh, very thoroughly um, documented. And um, I was just wondering, you know, uh, for now, just to start, how involved was she with that show in terms of placement and curation and was she happy was she dissatisfied um have you got any thoughts for us on that please uh maybe if we book mary want to give the the answer because yeah on that time we usually we from the gallery we the staff will organize and hanging and all this thing and also with Ibu Mary will organize the thing so maybe Ibu Mary as a guest can uh, giving some information about that yeah hi everybody um, my my uh, internet is so unstable I'm not sure I can make a sentence before I cut off but um, I think basically I would say our principle at the gallery was that it was the artist's choice, what they showed and how they showed it. And our staff, who were absolutely wonderful, Wayan, of course, leading the pack, um, but our staff would always do what the artist wanted. And, and, you know, never, we would never impose on the artist. It was always their choice how they presented their work, in what kind of order and, you know, everything, what sort of height, what kind of labelling. Um, the artist was always involved in that uh, fully. So, of course, if we did group shows, then, you know, we had to play a more, um, a, a larger curatorial role, but for, uh, for one woman shows, as I say, it was the artist's uh, responsibility and privilege, and uh, we were honoured that they showed with us. I mean, we were so honoured that Murney, uh, uh, our relationship with Murney over those years. So maybe that answers your question, partly. Partly, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Mary. Um, does anyone have other questions? If not, uh, did I hear someone? Or no, okay. Um, if not, you can also send in your questions later on at art at kajagallery.com and you'll try to get them to Wayan and Mondo as well. <laughs> and yeah, we're, we're 
we're just hitting the one hour. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us today, the audience, and most especially to our speakers, Wayan and Mondo, for sharing your time and your memories so generously with us today. Um, if For those who would like a copy of the publication that also contains uh, the biography and you know, some interviews, some quotes from Wayan and Mondo too of Mernie, uh, you can go to our website at gadgetgallery.com to pre-order the exhibition catalog. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the last week of the show, which closes tomorrow. So if you haven't visited the gallery yet, please do. Uh, we look forward to sharing these last few days of this special show with you. And you can check out our social media pages on Instagram and Facebook for further announcement on this exhibit and our future events. So thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, Ayan. Ciao, Mondo. Say hi. Say hi, say hi. See you soon. Yeah. Thank you. You too. And Thank you. And the family. Terima kasih. Sama-sama. Yeah, sama-sama. Yeah. Bye. 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 Hello, Mary. Yeah. <laughs>